Hey, how's it going? I've had a rough last couple of videos with Zubat followed by the awful ditto and I had to take a week off to do a different kind of video. Can you really blame me? But if you follow Pokemon theories, you know that ditto is a failed attempt at cloning Mew into Mewtwo. So that segues us into this week's video on Mew as if you didn't already read the title or see the thumbnail. Mew's just a very interesting Pokemon. Its stats are perfectly balanced with a nice and even 100 in each of them. And it has the very unique ability to learn every single TM and HM in the entire game. Like pretty much every Pokemon outside of Mewtwo I guess, Mew does have its flaws but it's very intriguing and it's enough to have it step up to the plate and see how fast it can beat the game and see where it stacks up to the current elite of the ones I've done in the past. I've been wanting to do a Mew run for quite a while and I'm excited about diving into this one. But before we begin, if you are new to the channel and Pokemon solo runs are something that sounds interesting to you, consider subscribing to help the channel grow and just to be kept up to date with my videos. Likes and comments also help break into that dreaded YouTube algorithm so if you're someone who normally just never interacts or you just don't know what to say, scroll down and type in Hell Bingus in the comments below. And if you don't know who Bingus is, it's a hairless cat that was a really popular meme and I just can't let it go so don't judge me. With that said, sit back, relax, grab yourself a soda pop and this week let's just get back into having a little bit of fun. Let's just dive into it. Right from the start, I grab Mew, make sure I get good IVs, and I name it Bingus so we can begin our very own Bingus quest. The one immediate thing you'll notice is that Mew only starts off with Pound, and that's just not very good for these how fast runs, where some of these Pokemon start off with a full complement of moves or just straight up with the best moves in the game like Mewtwo with Psychic. This puts us immediately behind the curve because while Mew can learn every single TM, there's no TMs to be had until you get to Mount Moon, we need to keep a level head here and have a plan to get through Brock as fast and efficient as humanly possible. Here I go back and I implement a Needle King strategy where I immediately take on the optional rival fight. I'm only level 6, but that really isn't a problem. I do this on my first attempt and there's two great things that Mew has going for it. First is that it's not in the slow leveling group like you might expect with all the other legendaries. It's actually in the medium slow group and the name is a little misleading if you don't know because it's actually the fastest group to get to level 25 and that's just really good. It's probably the best leveling group in my opinion. Second is that Mew has a base speed of 100, which means critical hits are fairly consistent at a rate of slightly less than 20. It's 19.53% if you really needed me to be specific. These two things can really alleviate a slow start and I'm hoping that's what's going to happen here. Moving on from there, there's no wild Pokemon battles. It's all straight trainers and the only other moves that Mew will learn for now is transform at level 10. The channel wants inner ditto and give me some PT. PTSD. Only having pound means that unfortunately I do have to heal at the Poke Center because I'll need all the pound PP I can get. Looking ahead at Brock, it's not ideal, but we do have to work with what we got and it's just, it is what it is. We have to do it. I hit level 13 off the junior trainer and you might think that this is problematic to only have transform and pound going into Brock and I'll be the first person to admit that it's not great. It's actually pretty awful. It does take me quite a few tries to get this fight right and as far as Geodude goes, there's really not any strategy at all. You just have to keep tapping an A on Pound and all the retries here took place on just hoping that I survive with enough HP going into the Onyx. Crits are very nice here and it's pretty inevitable that you'll at least get a few out of all the turns you'll be going through but it's really just like I said it's just a bunch of tapping A and just waiting to see if it works out. On my successful attempt I'm only at 23 HP and that's really not great but I do keep going I give it a try anyway. The strategy here is to just stand tall and pound for several turns even when it uses bide you gotta just stay in there. We've been over transform ad nauseum we know how it works so I don't want to immediately turn into onyx after it gets off the bide I'm only at 15 HP and from there I transform I set up some screeches to lower its defense and I generally just kind of make do with what I got I end up on struggle strats and I barely squeak this one out with only 7 HP but it's honestly just very impressive that a Pokemon with pound and transform can get through this normally awful battle at a mere level 13 unfortunately going through the junior trainer and Brock has depleted almost 
almost all of my power points and once again Mew does have to heal to get through the next part of the game and in a run like this it's a pretty huge disadvantage if you want to break into those top few spots. With that said I do save at 20 minutes and it's still a pretty respectable time considering what we had at the start. From there Water Gun is the first TM I get access to. It's not great but with only pound it pretty much doubles our pool of PP to hopefully allow us to make up some time from that slow start. It's also worth mentioning that I do pass Mega Punch to save some more time and if you notice from the moves on the sidebar here Mew actually learns Mega Punch naturally at level 20 and with the medium slow leveling group we'll be there soon enough so I'm continuing on with minimum battles and trying to just save as much time as humanly possible. Now let's pick up in Cerulean at rival number 2 and since I don't do any extra battles I'm only level 18. In contrast to Ditto even having a lowly move like Pound combined with Mew's good stats makes fights really straightforward and simple and that's just great after going through Ditto. I don't struggle on this one and after the last couple of videos Zubat Ditto I'm, I'm all for this. Afterwards I do need Mega Punch for Misty so I finish up Nugget Bridge to dump some of my PP and other moves because I will need to heal at the Poke Center to anchor myself here for some key time skips in the game anyway so I may as well get the most out of my moves that I can. This takes us to Misty and with Mega Punch this fight doesn't really take too long. I would like to take this time to talk about Mew's nice even 100 in each stat. It actually makes it really tanky on top of having just great speed, it crits fairly often, and it hits pretty hard. Mew is a generalist rather than being a jack of all trades, master of none type, and it more or less just excels in whatever you need it to do, but we'll kind of dive into movesets as we progress through the video. Defeating Misty gets us access to Bubble Beam, and just like with Dental King and Mewtwo, this is an excellent early move that supplements the move pool, and it just allows us to spend even more time away from Poke Centers. I finish up the route to Bill's house, and down in the SSN, getting Body Slam is the first order of business. It's really key to the success of the run, and we know how strong of a move this is early in Gen 1, but for now, I just want it for later. I also battle the Gentleman Guard in the Rare Candy since I have water moves, and that just makes it really quick and painless, and we can just move straight to rival number 3. Overall, this is very similar to the second rival fight, except now I have Mega Punch. Body Slam is clearly superior, but I want to go without visiting a Poke Center if possible, so I want to use up everything I got. I'm also not discussing variation of move pools or even really discussing the fact that I did multiple Mew runs testing out different combinations because honestly the early part of the game doesn't really have many options and it's just going to look similar regardless of how you're going to be playing it so let's move on. Lieutenant Surge is next and Mega Punch just slaps as a move. I really like it. I know it's inferior to Body Slam in every way and the lower accuracy feels awful when you miss but there's just something really satisfying about punching Pikachu right in the face. I do actually get low in this fight and I get paralyzed but keep in mind I did start the fight at less than half health so I was never really worried about losing this battle. Of course winning this fight gets us access to Thunderbolt and my feelings on this move is that it's a top tier coverage move and you should use it whenever it's available to your Pokemon. You can run Mew with an all physical move set but after testing multiple runs I firmly believe that special is better but we'll go into that in various parts of the video but it's worth talking about now. After burning the rest of my PP of Pound and Mega Punch leading into Rock Tunnel I do replace them both with Body Slam and Thunderbolt to make our move set much stronger moving forward and in terms of Rock Tunnel there's nothing to see here let's just keep it rolling. In Celadon it's time for our errands of the run and we'll talk about some moves here real quick. Generally trading some Sody Pops to the little girl has something for you regardless of if you're special or physical but in this run I'm not touching Rock Slide or Ice Beam. I tried both and keep in mind you're watching the third run of Mew that I've done and in this run where everything was optimized and already tested you just don't need them. If you want the TLDR it all comes down to that Rock Slide provides the same coverage as Thunderbolt but it is weaker and it's way less accurate and Ice Beam only shines in two specific parts of the game at the very end. Also keep in mind that Mew has 100 in every single stat so you don't necessarily need to go all physical or all special but with that said I do actually spend all my money on two calciums to bolster my special stat while I'm in the area before I get fly and I just move along. Next I pick up Psychic and it's extremely hard to not use Psychic on a run with a Psychic type that has as good of a special stat as Mew does and that's really all I'm going to say about that now. This might be a weird sentence but in a lot of ways Psychic and Earthquake provide the same coverage in some key fights and generally you're just going to pick one or the other. Fights like Koga and Agatha go the same way if you have either of them and luckily for you guys I've tested them out both but obviously Psychic is going to win out because this is the this is the footage that you're watching here. I zoom through the rocket hideout with a move pool of Bubble Beam, Thunderbolt, Psychic, and Body Slam and our Bengus is just looking pretty strong now. Bubble Beam just slices up the Onyx and the Rhyhorn and if I had any critiques on myself looking over the footage is that 
I should have went Psychic rather than Thunderbolt on the Kangaskhan and I could have saved a turn. But a single turn in the grand scheme of things, just I'm not worried about it. It doesn't mean anything. Now we're just cruising along and now it's time for Erica. Fun fact, uh, I ruined an entire test run and I had to start over because I forgot all about Erica and by the time I remembered I had already saved and I wasted several minutes. I'm not sure what makes Erica so forgettable, but if you want to know how serious I'm actually taking this fight, I do just enter it at 35 health because I'm so confident and totally not because I forgot to heal because I obviously never make any mistakes. I'm perfect. Next up is Pokemon Tower and rival number four. And this run is a lot like Mewtwo here. I haven't healed since Misty and I'm running low on my PP reserves, but I did try to plan it out so that I barely make it through this fight in the upcoming channeler for the game's one free heal so I get all my PP back. Talking about the fight, I do have all the tools needed and I have just a huge level advantage and that usually helps here unless you're a Pokemon named Ditto and it's just an easy fight not worth getting into. I finish up the tower and now we can just scoot along to Fuchsia. Now let's talk about Koga. We have Psychic against his poison types and if you want to know how this battle goes it's, it's fairly simple. Psychic can one shot the two coughings and the muck and the only thing Koga can really hang his hat on is the fact that Weezing barely survives one Psychic and it actually takes two to finish it off. But this is a great gem to get done because of that sweet speed part of the badge boost. But I will say that with a base stat of 100 there really aren't many things that's going to outspeed Mew anyway. But that's the fifth badge down and we are just inching closer and closer at this point in the run and I'm feeling pretty good about it. Sylph Company is the last area that we can go to at this point and Mew's at a pretty great pace. I don't want to put any false expectations on you guys but it's a weird feeling honestly because I don't think that any pre-evolved run can come close to Ghastly and in this case I don't think any general Pokemon can touch Mewtwo. This means that no matter what run I do we're just always going to be competing for second place at best as I kind of fill out the tier list and while Mew isn't going to hit the top top spot. It's actually looking like it's up in the air if it can get a top 5 spot or even like a number 2 spot and that's pretty exciting for me at least. Now talking about some moves once again. Sylph Co is a great place for Pokemon that use a physical moveset. It's their dream. Earthquake and the coveted Swords Dance are both here for any Pokemon that can use them and Mew can luckily just use both. I opt to not use Earthquake in this run in favor of a Stab Psychic but I do pick up Swords Dance but we're just going to hang on to that for now. This means I'm going into rival number 5 with a moveset of Thunderbolt, Bubble Beam, Psychic, Body Slam. I do fail once here and it's just because I just hard reset. It's because I don't have a great way to deal with Execute. Ice Beam would be great here, but we'll see later exactly why I don't need it. But Reflect is the big enemy here. Paralysis and Sleep are also very annoying, but I could just theoretically shrug them off and just win anyway, but I just reset. On the second attempt, I realized that I don't need to be meticulous and reset. I plow through the Pidgeot and the Growlithe with super effective moves and that brings us to the Execute. And Things are pretty much the same as last time, except it's actually worse because I take a Leech Seed in addition to it setting up Reflect, but I just press on anyway to see how it's going to go. Reflect is specifically awful since Alakazam is the main reason I have Body Slam and halving its damage just feels bad, so since Reflect is up I just go straight Thunderbolt. It does take three of them to get through and I'm getting a little low, but we're just, we'll keep going, we'll see how it goes. I have a couple of Thunderbolts left for Blastoise and despite taking some chip damage and Leech Seed doing its best to hold me down. I'm still able to get past this one, and that's pretty good. This fight showed Mew's ability to handle some adversity, which is a pretty great quality to have for these kind of runs. Next up is Giovanni number two, and I'm just well equipped. I don't need to go into detail about this one. Instead, I'd like to talk about my initial thoughts about Mew, and I guess this is kind of a weird spot to put it in, but why not? It's Giovanni number two. My original idea is that I really wanted to utilize Soft Boiled since it's a very rare move and otherwise exclusive to Chansey, and we'll probably never see it on the channel. It's a essentially just like recover, but the idea was that if I can't die, then the run would be a lot smoother. And what ended up happening was I was just steamrolling everything and I never had to use a Poke Center outside of Cerulean. So at the end of the day, what's the point? If it's just, you don't need it, you know, there's no point to it. But that's Giovanni down, let's move on. I just want to talk about Soft Boiled for a millisecond. Afterwards, I finally head to the Safari Zone to pick up the final HMs of the run. And I held off on this part so that I'd have Lapras already from Silphco, since that's my designated surf and strength user for all my runs and that way I could just go ahead and teach it those and I could go ahead and use strength on the boulder to get this rare candy so I didn't have to waste any more time and pretty much get the most out of it. Now it's time for the most brisk of swims down to Cinnabar on this lovely day and after doing the bare minimum it's time for some 
Tombstoner, brother. As I make my way towards Blaine. And just like with Mewtwo, this is the main reason I held on to Bubble Beam. It doesn't really make this fight much better than going just straight psychic, but overall it is very easy. I get through it without any hassle. The one thing of major importance here is that I get access to the special part of the badge boost. And although it took late into the game, it's of pretty big importance. You see, the biggest difference in this run compared to the other two that I did was that in this one I use a mix of special and physical moves on top of using sword stance. Badge boosting is just absurdly strong. I don't need to tell any of you guys that. But when you combine swords dance with a stab psychic and then you have coverage moves like thunderbolt and body slam, then you just have a monster on your hands. And we'll see how that plays out. I also have to use an elixir here going into Sabrina to avoid the pokey center on this little final stretch of the game. But let's take a look at Sabrina. And this is where body slam pays dividends. You're going to need it anyway for the Alakazam specifically when you're looking ahead. And while it doesn't resist thunderbolt, it has such high special, which means it essentially just pseudo resist it, and Body Slam just helps out a lot. I don't take any chances on Kadabra, I just go ahead and I get it out of there. And then I set up some Swords Dance on the Mr. Mime, and that allows me to take out the usual Raid Boss in a single hit, and it's just really a nice cleanup, and that's the seventh badge down. Another thing I'll give Mew a lot of credit for is that after having to heal twice before and after Brock, we are still digging back to Cerulean after we anchored ourselves there, meaning that we only healed one time after Pewter City. And and that's just a big accomplishment in itself. It's something that only Mewtwo has done so far for me. And let's take a look at Giovanni. I feel like I might level up, so I don't bother setting up at the start. I'll just lose it all. I have Psychic to one hit the right horn. Then I have Body Slam just to slap down the Doug Trio. I do level up, and from there, I just set up fully on the Nidal Queen. And from that point, the special boost on Psychic means that I have no problem one-shotting the rest of his team. I also perfectly level up to level 47 after the fight, which means that there's no worries about needing to manipulate my experience for the next fight. Speaking of which, let's just get right into rival number six. And these last battles are where the badge boost plus some of the best moves in the game set this specific build apart from the others. At the start, I do two swords dance here. I'm not sure if one would be enough, but I know I at least need a little boost because of my other runs, but I do two just to keep it extra safe. Afterwards, I use a thunderbolt and that's good enough to move us on. From there, Rhyhorn and Growlithe aren't worth diving into. They are just one shots and let's get into the pit falls of the fight. Execute was a real big thorn in my side for the all special run, but Body Slam combined with a boost are all that's needed here. We can just get it out of the way and that's exactly what you want. Alakazam is next and if I can one shot Execute, I can certainly one shot this. I do outspeed it and that's exactly what happens here. One shot is over. Unfortunately, I do go down to the Blast Toys here on my first attempt because I was trying to save as much time as possible and I didn't heal. I went into this fight at only 70 HP, which is about 40% of my max health and a Hydro Pump is enough to take me out. If I didn't level up after the Alakazam, I do think the boost would have been enough to one-shot it, but it is what it is. There's no reason for concern. I simply waste a few seconds on the reset to use a potion, and I go back through with the same results, except that I'm at enough health on the Blastoise to where it just really doesn't matter what it does, and that's the fight. It moves us on. Now we're just zooming over to the Elite Four as fast as I can. I skip the Rare Candy and Victory Road just to save a tiny bit more time, and at this point, I'm just hoping for a nice top five spot with Mew, and I was very invested and interested in how this run would stack up against the other ones that I did in practice. With that said, I do use all but three of my rare candies since I'll need ones later to reset our experience for the final fights, but let's just dive into Lorelei. And the Elite Four kind of shapes the decision for what builds you want to use for most Pokemon as they should. And if you guys want to know the real reason I think the physical moveset is inferior, look no further than this fight. Growl maims your damage and almost forces a reset, even if you just get hit with one of them. But just look at this fight when I set up on Dugong. I actually get two Growls and then an attack drop from the Aurora Beam. It would have been a reset for sure, but since I'm running Thunderbolt, it's absolutely meaningless and it actually boosts my special even further with Badge Boost, so it's just perfect. I take it out and then I take the momentum just to run through the rest of the fight. Cloyster and Slowbro can't withstand the extra boosted super effective attacks. And from this point, I'm kind of in a lull here. I just keep pressing A, which means I mistakenly use a Thunderbolt on the very special tanky Jinx. And it cost me a turn, but that's alright. At the end, Lapras is our favorite tanky turtle, and of course it's going to survive a single bolt, but Mew can just shrug off the hydro pump that it does on its turn, and that takes the fight. In my opinion, Lorelei is awful for physical attackers, and with the rock slide earthquake set that I did earlier, there were several resets just to avoid the growls and attack drops. And how about we just not talk about Bruno this week? I'm a psychic type, and there's not a doubt in anyone's mind what's going to happen here. I set up, and I just go to town, and let's just look ahead 
ahead. There's nothing of substance to see here, just Psychic knocking down every single one of his pathetic Pokemon. Now let's take a look at Agatha. A Psychic type shouldn't have any problems in this fight. I go for one Swords Dance, I get a failed Dream Meter from the Gengar, I hit a Psychic, and unfortunately it doesn't one hit. Agatha then changes into Golbat aggressively, and then it uses Haze, and that just ruins my whole entire vibe here. I still try to set up one after, and I take it out, but unfortunately I forgot to Rare Candy, and I level up right after the Golbat. The Gengar comes back in, but Mew's excellent speed means that I am faster and I finish it off, and since I'm faster than the Gengar, of course that means I'm also going to one hit the Haunter and one hit the Arbok with zero issues, and I'm just cruising along in the fight. Now it's time for the final Gengar. I outspeed, and predictably Psychic isn't enough for a one shot, but it just goes for a Confuse Ray. I shrug it off, and I finish off the fight, and that's Agatha done, and it goes about how you would expect for a strong special stat Psychic user. Lance is next, and I'll just go ahead and get rid of the annoying ass Gyarados thanks to another great use for Thunderbolt. This, honestly, Lorelai and Gyarados are the reason why Thunderbolt are so good. After that, I do set up on the first Dragonair, and I do take actually a pretty big chunk of damage as a result, but with all of my stats boosted now, I can just go on a tear here. I guess this is the time to talk about Ice Beam's exclusion from the final moveset. The only difference in this specific fight is that the Dragonite is now a two shot from Psychic rather than a one shot from Ice Beam, and that's not really that significant, but in the next fight we'll talk more about Ice Beam and the main reason I went without it. But that's the fight. Mew's just kind of killing it here. And now there's only one battle left. And personally, I was pretty anxious to see how Mew was going to do. It's been quite a while since I've done a good run, guys. And as for the beginning of this fight, it's all standard and how you would expect. I'm going to set up on the Pidgeot, and then I can just ride that wave of boost to get easy one-shots over the previously mentioned Pidgeot, also on Alakazam, Rhydon, and then ultimately the Arcanine as well. There's no reason to go into depth here. These are all just easy one-shots. Mew's stats are great, and I'm just really boosted, so it's just kind of a slaughter. But I will talk about Executor. The real and true reason to not bring Ice Beam here is that Executor's special stat is very high, very thick, and this little coconut tree can actually survive an Ice Beam while Boosted Body Slam just one hits it. I'm not gonna lie, this does actually make me interested in a solo run of Executor, but I do think it'll be awful, but I will look into it. Finally, it's onto the Blastoise, the last thing in the way of finishing the run. I just leveled up, that's unfortunate, I lost my boost, but I just say get out of here. I crit and I just finish off the run in style, that's exactly what you want to see, and Mew's done it. It was kind of a slow start, very reminiscent of like Starmie and all that kind of stuff, but afterwards it followed in the steps of Mewtwo and Nidoking in terms of really never using a Poke Center after that. I was impressed, but before I give some closing thoughts, let's just get to the time. Mew finishes with a level of 61 and a time of 2 hours and 46 minutes. This means that Mew barely edges out Gengar ever so slightly by the smallest of margins by a single minute and at the same level, and that means that Mew takes over the number 4 spot, and that's very respectable considering how you gotta start out with only Pound. I was really impressed, and you might be curious about how the other runs went. All the runs were very close in time, it was pretty weird actually. The all physical moveset took 2 hours and 47 minutes, meaning that it was 1 minute slower, but I did finish at level 62 because I did some extra fights, and I had everything kinda optimized out by the time I got to this one, and the all special build took 2 hours and 49 minutes, and it was just missing that extra little punch that late game Swords Dance gives you in this run after you defeat Blaine and get that special badge boost. I know I say I don't like to redo runs, but Mew is really the only exception for sure. It just has so many different ways that you could play it, but when you've played Red and Blue so much, there's always going to be an optimal way to get things done, and that's why you're just seeing the same moves and the same things as other runs. It's just what's best, and there's no way to deviate from it when you're going for the best time. But I had fun, and we just need to accept that no other Pokemon will be able to touch Mewtwo in this tier list, and when we do pre-evolve Pokemon, nothing else is going to be able to touch Ghastly. That's just the reality. I still find it really fun, and I would like to fill out a full tier list eventually, but we'll slowly get there. Mew was a very satisfying run. It was really nice, especially after following some of the most frustrating runs I've ever done in my entire life, and hopefully I'm feeling a little bit more re-energized going forward about playing these games. But that's going to be it for me. I appreciate you guys, and I got some ideas for some pre-evolved runs coming up. I'm open to some future suggestions as well if you want to give me some of those, except I'm going to look into it a little bit more. I'm not going to blindly do another 10 plus, 20 plus hour run anytime soon because I do value my free time more than that. You guys have to understand that I could have probably put out four videos in the time that I did the ditto video. But I digress. I'm done. I hope you guys have a great week, and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye.